All right, well, welcome. And if you missed last week of Diary of a Secret Sinner, week one, Dave Wilson did a great job. I encourage you to go online and watch that. We talked about what it means to not compromise. And today, as was mentioned, we're talking about pride. So today's title is called, I'm So Proud of Me. So we're going to go ahead and pray as we launch into this together. Would you pray with me as we begin? Heavenly Father, we're just incredibly grateful for today. We ask your blessing on our time together. And Lord, we ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would speak to us. Lord, nudge us, encourage us, challenge us, and help us to know what adjustment or course correction that we should make in our own lives. So Father, uh, thank you for your blessings and this wonderful day. And we ask and pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, hey, my name is Chris Zarba, and I am one of the pastors here, and I'm excited for you to be here. And as we talked about pride, um, I just want to let you know that I was thinking through this, and I was thinking about a story that I went through. Uh, At one one of my previous churches that I worked at, we were holding like a vacation Bible school in the area, and I was actually uh, going door to door with a friend of mine named Jim, and we were knocking on doors trying to pied piper kids to this vacation Bible school thing that we were having. So, you know, we didn't have enough kids, and so I was going around like knocking doors like, hey, we're having this thing down the road, you know? And so anyway, so Jim and I were sort of knocking on doors and meeting families and kids were going to this place. It was great. And on one of the doors that I knocked on, um, the the, the lady who opened the door uh, recognized me. And so I knocked on the door. She opens it and she goes, oh, hey, it's you. And I was like, oh, hey, how you doing? And I just immediately knew that somehow, I don't know, she's been to the church or whatever, but she somehow recognized me. And so we're sitting there talking about kids and everything else. Well, at the end of the conversation, the thing I got made fun of uh, for doing was this. I said this statement. I said, I said, well, obviously you know who I am, so what is your name? And then afterwards, when we left the house, my buddy Jim is like, dude, he's like, obviously you know who I am. And then all of a sudden, it turned into my entire staff making fun of me for like two years, I think it was up to, where they were like, hey, I'm not sure you know how big of a deal I am around these parts. But, you know, I'm, you know, and so they they started, I was like, dude, that is not what I said. She recognized me and then they just, you know, wouldn't let it go. So here's what I believe. I believe that a lot of us can have moments where we sort of, you know, uh, you know, pride creeps in or, or it at least appears like there's a little bit of a pride thing going on. And for some of us, maybe you have a moment where you may think a little high of yourself, as obviously I came across that way knocking on doors. Or maybe for some of you, uh, the pride comes in where you don't want help from anybody right? And so in other words, like, you're like, hey, I can do this by myself. I, I, I got this. And sometimes that can even bleed into our relationship uh, with our Heavenly Father, not needing Him and doing it by ourselves. And then sometimes it's just a bunch of little things. And maybe the pride moments are just sort of a driving force that nudges you upward and you take the slot of places where it's reserved only for God. But either way, I want you to know that there are many different kinds of of prides. Before we move on, it's important to know this. Not all prides are evil. In fact, there are good prides. Even though the Bible calls pride a sin, there are actually not all you know, moments of being proud are sinful. In fact, um, I'm very proud of my kids. Are you with me in this? Are you proud of your kids? And you should be, right? Yeah, that'll, that'll get a cheer. That'll get a cheer. And, and guess what? That's a good pride. You could be proud of someone else, and that's a good pride. Uh, you could be proud of yourself, of, of, of how, you're, how you're doing, or, or, or something you've accomplished. That's a good pride. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, in fact, um, uh, the, third t- the, the third kind that I was thinking of is this. You could and you should be proud of who you are. And so all of these kind of prides, and I'm sure there's a lot more, uh, you know, th- there's nothing wrong with those. But the Bible does refer to bad pride and sinful pride, and that's when pride sort of gets out of balance, or when it sort of creeps up and it, you know, right sizes and trumps uh, that which should not be ever trumped. So uh, think about this. Did you know that pride was the original sin? And when I say original sin, most people think of Adam and Eve in the garden. We believe that's a literal and true story, by the way. But I'm talking about even before that. Uh, the Bible says in many passages, and including like, I think it's Ezekiel chapter 28, where it talks about Lucifer was created as an angel, angelic being with so much wisdom and strength and beauty that he himself thought that he should have the place of God. That was the original sin. And then, and, then, and then from there on, I don't know if you know this or not, but actually the driving factor of the sin of the Garden of Eden, which was eating the fruit, that was driven by pride. Because after all, if you look, listen to the serpent's words, uh, Lucifer said, 
to Eve, he said, first of all, he said, did God really say you're going to die? You're not going to die, questioning God's authority. And by the way, that was a half-truth. But then he says, God knows that you'll be like him and, and that you'll know good and evil. You'll be like him. Don't you want to be like him? And so pride drives the, 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 uh, the first sin in the garden because it says, and then Eve looked and saw it was desirable and she ate some of the fruit, gave it to Adam and he ate it. So we're talking about pride being very subtle and very strong. And I believe that it's just as strong and subtle today as it was back then, because again, it's in us. And it's hard to recognize in ourselves, but other people see it in us. In fact, I believe pride is so subtle that I believe it's hard to identify even in Christian culture, but it's there. It's there all over the place. So um, I went to uh, Baptist Bible College, which is a statement that I rarely say out loud, uh, but there were some good parts of that college. But I went there, and actually there was like a weight room where you lifted weights, like free weights, and it was all donated like garbage and everything like this, right? But if you've ever been in any type of weight room where it's a Christian weight room, uh, if you see a verse posted on a wall, chances are I know what that verse is. It's Philippians 4.13. As a matter of fact, maybe if you go to church, you can complete the verse for me. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me or gives me strength, depending on the version, right? And now, the operative word, by the way, that whole, the whole secret of that verse is through Christ. But I remember being up there, I'm like putting on a lot of weight, I'm like trying to do another rep, you know, and they're like, come on, man, you could do it, you could do it, and then boom, I do it, and he goes, yeah, and he points to the poster on the wall, and I promise you it looks something like this. I can do all things. And then the little part at the bottom goes, through Christ, <laughs> through Christ, right? It's like, it's like, wait a minute, isn't that just out of proportion? But I'm telling you, if you see it, though, that's what it is. I can do all things. And it sort of just champions, you know, it's like, no, no, that's not really what it says, right? Or how about this one? How about this one? My power is made perfect. And then the little tiny thing in the bottom says, in weakness, <laughs> which, by the way, is, again, the operative word. My power is made perfect in weakness, right? And so, again, it's just one of those things where somehow something is not right size, something is out of balance, and somehow we end up on top, even though the verse doesn't say that at all. Uh, what's interesting is, is that uh, there are so many examples of pride in the Bible, and I've picked out three, and I've given them really cheesy and hopefully memorable names. And so here's the first one I, I refer to as this. The Pharisee heresy. Isn't that fun to say? In fact, I want you to say it with me. Ready? The Pharisee heresy. And that means this. I'm better because of how much I've been blessed. And that's the heart of a Pharisee. Now, Pharisees were the chosen people, so they already felt special. They were the elite of all people. But not only that, but a Pharisee was the elite of the elite. Because I, you know, if you're a person that's a Pharisee, you had enough wisdom. You stood out above the crowd. You have enough you know, uh, smarts and discipline and behavior and morality. And so you're the elite of the elite of the elite. And, and if you're a Pharisee, man, that's just kind of how they walked around you know, conducting themselves. And by the way, Pharisees in the Bible were the religious leaders, and they were just about the only people that Jesus rebuked while he was on earth, period. And he, he talks against them all the time. Now, the Pharisee heresy mentality is something that uh, I don't like the most. In fact, if you know me at all, uh, we do this podcast, uh, Jeff and I do, called The Bible Guys, Monday through Friday, thebibleguys.com if you want to look it up. But we do this segment called uh, uh, What Made Chris Mad This Week? And, and I'm telling you, of all the different kinds of examples in the Bible that gets me mad, this makes me mad the most. I loathe this mentality, right? And here's the mentality that Pharisees had in the day, which is this. My preferences should be your preferences. And if my preferences aren't your preferences, I'm right and you're wrong. I'm superior and you're not. I'm better, you're less than. That's what it is. Because Pharisees made rules to make sure that people didn't uh, break the rules. So if, if this were a cliff right? And, and, and God says, don't jump off the cliff. Pharisees would make a rule that says, don't get near the cliff. And they create this rule like a guardrail, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with guardrails. That's a good practice. But what they would do is they would, they would see somebody behaving and they would step over here and they'd say, no, 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 that's sin. And they're like, what are you talking about? That's not even close to sin. That's not what the Bible says. Don't wear that skirt. Don't have that tattoo. You know, whatever garbage they came up with. But, but basically what it says is they, they were like, don't, like my preference is the law. And, and they're like, what are you talking about? And I think that how it translates for us today is there are Christians who do that. There are Christians who go, this is my personal conviction. 
And if you're not obeying my personal conviction, and you're like, what are you talking about? It's not even sin. And you're like, but I don't care. It's sort of close to sin, and therefore you're wrong. And, and that, when that happens, man, that gets Chris mad right? And so the Pharisee heresy is just one of those things where, where it, it, it exists today, and it's, and it's like, hey, somehow I'm better. And so um, look at look what Jesus had to say about the Pharisees in Matthew 23. Look at verse number 27. He said, woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs. And if you've ever seen a tombstone that's bright white, it's very beautiful. And he says, you are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So the Pharisee heresy is sort of a one kind of pride mentality. But here's what I'm calling the next one. Ready? The blameless lame mess. All right? Uh, Isn't that fun? It's so bad. I know. It's so bad. But we're going to say it together. Ready? The blameless lame mess. And that says that I'm better because of my obedience. And this was made popular by someone the Bible refers to as the rich young ruler. And if you know the story of the Bible, you'll know that this, it's important to know, this pride was not directed toward other people like the Pharisees. This pride was directed toward God himself. Because this man, this rich young ruler, walked up to Jesus, and we don't have time to read the whole story, but he walked up to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus names off the Ten Commandments, or at least most of them, and he lists them up. You know the commandments, and he started listing them off. And then this man just somehow thinks that nothing about him stinks, nor anything that comes out of him stinks, because here's his response to Jesus personally, facing God face to face. In Mark chapter 10, verse number 20, It says, the man said to him, teacher, I have wholeheartedly obeyed all of these laws since my youth. It's almost as if he's saying, what else you got, right? Like, I've done those things. Now, you probably, if you've been around long enough, you know that that the Bible clearly tells us the Ten Commandments were given to us not as a bar to meet, but actually they were given to us to prove to us that none of us can keep them. The lowest common denominator of human behavior we fail to meet. That's why they were given to us, to show us we're sinful. Can you imagine, face to face with Jesus himself, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Do these things, and you're like, I've done all those things. What else? What else you got? And it's like, what are you talking about? And by the way, how that translates today, it's a little more subtle for us today, right? It's not quite as so brazen as that. But for us today, here's what we think. We think like, yeah, I may need God, but I don't need God as much as somebody else. Like, I may be bad, but I'm not as bad as that girl right there in the front row, right? I'm not as bad as that guy. Look at him. Oh, geez, right? Like, and so you start to think that maybe somehow you're better than everybody else because you're obedient. And that's dangerous because what you're saying is you don't need God as much as you think you need God. You know, one of my favorite quotes is by the late Tim Keller, where he actually says, here's the bad news. The bad news is you're way worse off than you know. And then he says, but the good news is, you're more loved than you ever dared dream. You see, that's the truth about us. You're way worse off than you think you are, right? But you're more loved than you ever knew or dreamed in your life. And that's the truth about the gospel. But, you know, the mentality that says, hey, I'm blameless. That's the operative word here. The blameless, blameless. I'm blameless from what I do. And yet the Bible warns against thinking of ourselves too highly. Look what it says in Galatians chapter 6, verse number 3. Paul says, If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. I'll give you one more. Paul says, Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each one of you. Do you want to know the difference? I've always said this my whole career. Do you want to know the difference between cockiness and confidence? There's two, there's two different things. They appear to be you know, similar. They're close cousins. But cockiness, the worst version of cockiness is trusting completely in yourself. And the best version of confidence is trusting completely in God. And so, you know, there's just another example of some sort of pride that creeps up in our lives. And I believe it's applicable and present today as well. And then here's a third category, and I'm calling this the position rendition. All right, let's say that. Ready? The position rendition. And this says, I'm better because I'm valuable. 
And if you know the story, uh, there's a story where Jesus had 12 disciples and two of them were brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And James and John's mother went to Jesus and said, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, uh, you know, the person that sits on your right and the person that sits on your left, can they be my two sons? And if you've ever been a part of uh, or studied or learned about a kingdom, the one who sits on the throne is the most important person in the entire kingdom. The person who sits on the right is the second most important person, only second to the king in all the kingdom. And the third on the left uh, is is the third most important. And so think about this. Okay, the audacity. This is one of the most audacious requests, I think, in the entire Bible. Where, you know, the mother, this would be my mom, by the way. My mom would go to Jesus and say, I know that there's two coveted spots, but my boys deserve it, right? That's what my mom would say. They've done nothing wrong. And my wife knows that's true, right, with my mom. And so, you know, just like any mom would maybe do, right? And so Jesus responds to them, this this audacious request, by saying this. In Matthew chapter 20, look at verse number 26. He actually says to them, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. You see, the position rendition says, I'm valuable, or or, I'm I'm better because I'm valuable. Hey, I produce results. Look at me. Like, you know know how much I bring to the table? And, And I've got the goods. And so therefore, I believe I deserve a status. I believe I deserve a position of to be well known, to be well respected, right? That is, that's the idea, is to think yourself important. And here's how this translates. I think that there are a lot of us in the room, you've been involved in really great works of God, and they've happened only because of you, because you are the man or the woman. Like you are gifted with the gift of gab or a sales technique or or woo. I mean, you're an influencer, or maybe perhaps God has given you resources, and man, you just made this thing happen. And this whole movement, this whole cool thing that God has done is actually really because of you, because God has gifted you that much, and you are valuable right? And then sometimes in that situation, it's like, how much can you really, you know, sort of say thank you and recognize that it's really you without having all the glory go to you? And so the idea that the position rendition says, I'm important because I'm valuable and I'm better because I'm valuable. Again, it's very subtle and it's very strong. And I think it's very relevant in our lives. Now, I've taken some time to talk about three examples of bad prides, and now we're going to look at three statements from one man who actually, I think, gives us three incredible solutions or the ability to resist pride. In fact, I believe that this example that we're about to read about is uh, this person in the Bible, his name is John the Baptist, is the number one example of someone who resists pride more than anybody else in the whole Bible. And I believe it's because he had every reason to be more prideful than anybody else. And yet his whole life exudes resisting pride and and, and, and embracing humility. Um, A few things about John the Baptist. First of all, if you've been around church world, you know we call him John the Baptist. Uh, When I first went to church, I grew up Catholic, and then I bounced around to a Methodist church, and then I went to an Assemblies of God church for a little while, and then I sort of anchored myself into a Baptist church. And that's when I first learned about John the Baptist. And when I heard about him, I thought he was called John the Baptist because that was his denomination, right? Like, you know, I always thought, like, you know, there's Mary the Methodist and, you know, like uh, Paul the, you know, Pentecostal and Epiphania the Episcopalian, whatever, you know, and, and it's John the Baptist. That's what I thought. But that's not it at all. He was called John the Baptist because, believe it or not, he was the very first person to baptize another person. Because up until that point in the Old Testament, did you know that baptism existed? The, whole, the history of baptism was a self-cleaning ritual. When you converted to Judaism, you did a lot of different things, but one of the things, one of the things was an operation, if you're a male. The other thing was, you had to actually do this self-washing ritual that actually sort of symbolized, I'm washing away my old beliefs. I'm washing away my old person. Well, John the Baptist comes along, and he actually is the first person to do that with someone else, and he baptizes another person, which is amazing, by the way. Not only is that true of him, but he had thousands of followers. And the Bible tells us that they traveled 60 to 80 miles, a lot of them on foot, just to hear John the Baptist. And not only that, but think about this. Did you know that the Old Testament and the New Testament are separated by 400 years of silence? 
In other words, in the Old Testament, God spoke audibly. God had prophets. God had judges. God had people that represented him in his word. I mean, there were miracles. And then all of a sudden, you know, the prediction that one day there's going to be a Savior. One day there's going to be a Messiah. And then all of a sudden, by the time we flip from the last page of Malachi to the first page of Matthew, it's one flip for us. But for them, it's 400 years of nothing. God does nothing in terms of, you know, sending anyone. So think about this. So it's 2023. So if you take away 400 years, that would be equivalent to you and I trying to feel connected to the year 1623, which is when, like, pilgrims were around, right? Like, we're, like we're going to stay connected to that, and God hasn't shown up or sent anybody or spoken, then all of a sudden there's this guy who everybody you know, is following and he has thousands of followers. If there was anybody who had a reason to be prideful, it's John the Baptist. And not only that, but he was cousins with Jesus. He was six months older than Jesus. If, if you had a famous cousin, wouldn't you, uh, you, know, wouldn't you leverage that? Right? I, I, I got news for you. I, uh, back in the 80s, I'm from Youngstown, Ohio. Um, I had a famous second cousin. Uh, at the time, there was a, the, the, the lightweight boxing champion of the world was a guy named Ray Boom Boom Mancini. Has anybody heard that name? Raise your hand if you've heard that name. Okay? So at least a third of you, right? Okay, so he was my second cousin. So I go to like Jay's Hot Dogs and there's a big poster on the wall and it says the pride of Youngstown and there's Ray Boom Boom Man sitting on there and I'd be with my friends. I'd say, hey, that's my, that's my cousin. And they go, really? They're like, wow, like have you met him? I'm like, no, not at all. <laughs> Never once even talked to him. I have no idea who he is, right? But apparently he's my cousin, right? But that's my claim to fame. Can you imagine John the Baptist, right? I mean, Jesus raises somebody from the dead and he's like, yeah, it's my cousin, right? I mean, th- that's what I would do. It's like, it's in the blood, you know, whoa. It's, I, like, you could... I mean, just come on. If there was anybody who had a reason to feel pride, it was John. And yet, his life does the opposite to such a degree that Jesus makes a statement about John the Baptist that is unparalleled to every other human that had ever walked on the face of the planet. God himself says this about John the Baptist. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verse number 11. Jesus, by the way, uh, says, I tell you the truth, which your version may say, verily I say to you. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a preference uh, uh, that, that, that leads up to a big statement. He only said that when he was about to deliver a big statement. So he says, I tell you the truth of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Think about the weight of that statement. It's like, doesn't that make you jealous? Doesn't that make you, like, like I want to be that guy, Right? Jesus, God himself, of every human who's ever taken breath of the billions of people on the planet, John's number one. Are you kidding me? Right? That's incredible. So it stands to reason we ought to look at John's life and say, what was the number one characteristic about John? And you know what it was? Resisting pride. Embracing humility. In every aspect. So what I've done is I've taken... um, just a, a few statements from uh, uh, his uh, life here. One from Matthew chapter uh, 3, one from John chapter 3. I pieced them together, uh, just sort of in harmony of the Gospels kind of thing. So look, look, what it, how, look what it says. John says, I baptize with water to those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am so much greater that I am not worthy even to be his slave or carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how I have plainly told you, I am not the Messiah, I am only here to prepare the way for him. See, here's the first thing that John says in his message, and it's this, I am not the Christ I am just a messenger. And you know what that reminds us to do? You and I should rethink our status. And let me, let me tell you why that that's relevant. Because you know what status means? Status means if you've ever been in a boardroom meeting, you know that the person who sits at the head of the table is the most important, aren't they? And then they sort of go by rank. And by the way, that was the same in the first century. For every dinner, the most important all the way down to the least right? If you've ever been in some sporting events, uh, the way that they sit on the bench matters because it's first string, second string, third string, and that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a ranking of, of, of talent and position. 
right? If, if, you, if you're ever involved in, if you're a musical person and you've been to an orchestra, you've heard the terms first chair, second chair, third chair. And if you're in first chair and somebody comes along and then they get put in first chair, guess what happens? Everybody has to bump down one. And that's what, that's what John the Baptist is doing. In fact, all the way through his career, the only thing that he was doing, if you read over and over, it's almost as if what he's saying is this. Everybody's going, John, these people that, you were, that were following you are now following Jesus, and they brought it to him as a problem. And John, over and over, is like, everybody who was following me needs to leave me and go follow that guy. He's the Messiah. And they're like, John, you're so great. And he's like, no, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. I'm not worthy to be his slave. Do you understand? Follow him. He's the Messiah. I am merely a messenger. And this permeates all throughout John's career. And what he's really doing is he's, he's reshifting his status, right? And, and so even Jesus came to him and said, you need to baptize me in the Jordan River. And, and then John says, I'm not worthy to be baptized of you, but because Jesus insisted, John did it. And by the way, he baptized him in a normal body of water, which is how we know that, you know, when we get baptized, that there's nothing holy or special or mystical or magical about the waters. Everybody got baptized in a lake or a pond or a stream. And in this case, John baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, and the Bible says he dunked him, and straightway he came up out of the water. Uh, I went to Israel back in 2009, and uh, I had the chance to baptize uh, three women, I think it was, in the Jordan River. In fact, um, Diane was one of them, right here, Diane. You were there, you remember this. So what ends up happening is I put on shorts and then they give us like a little white robe, you know, and so we kind of wade into the Jordan River and the weird thing about it is because there was three ladies, all of them had their la- legs shaved and so the fish didn't worry about their legs, but my legs were not shaved and apparently they're hairy enough to where the fish want to nibble at them And so they're literally just nibbling at my feet the whole time. But the weird part is it was happening under the water that nobody could see. So I was going (laughs) like this and people are just watching me. And I'm trying to like make this a special thing for Diane. And I'm trying to like, you know, explain what baptism is. And the entire time I'm like, and then I'm doing this. Everybody's like, what's wrong with that guy? Right? I tried to make it about me. And, And I was trying to think of how many fish it was. It was like, if I really think about it, it's like, okay, carry the two. One million fish. One million fish were nibbling at me. And the entire time, I was like, uh, uh, beneath the water. But I was trying to make it all about Diane and her moment. But at the same time, it was just about me because of what happened, right? So in the Jordan River, John the Baptist baptizes Jesus and at the same time, just make sure that everybody knows who's first chair and who's not. Um, then look what John says in the very next verse. He makes another powerful statement. And he says this. Verse number 29 of John 3. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the best man is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. You know what basically John is saying here? He's saying to everybody who's listening, I am not the groom, I'm the best man. You know what that means? It reminds us that we should reinvent our serving. And I know what you're maybe thinking if you're paying attention. You're like, how is a best man connected with serving? You don't have to take my word for this. You can go home and Google this. Do you, do you know the history behind best men and groomsmen? Is that it actually came from the idea that when somebody was getting married, when it was risky or when it was illegal, especially in an occupied military territory, they would have secret weddings. And so therefore, what ended up happening was there was a bunch of groomsmen that were, that were chosen to wear the exact same thing as the groom. And then there was a bunch of bridesmaids that were chosen to wear the exact same dress as the bride so that if somebody burst in at this illegal wedding and they were to try to either kidnap the bride or kill the groom, everybody would run around. There would be so much chaos that nobody would know who was the groom or the bride. And guess, guess who was most responsible to give his life first more than any other person? The best man. And so his, his service to the best man wasn't just like, you know, we think of best man and we're like, what's his responsibility? Do you have the rings? They're in my pocket. Do you have the rings? That's it. That's all he does, right? That is not what it was. The best man, it was in service to such a degree that he would literally give his life. Now, uh, you could also Google this. Uh, you know how sometimes things bleed into our tradition and we have no idea where they come from? right? Well, for those, old enough, those in the room old enough to remember the cummerbund that was a part of uh, tuxedo tradition, that's where they hid their weapons. 
So everybody had cummerbunds with weapons. That's why the cummerbund eventually turned into a fashion piece and made it into tuxedos. And so it's interesting. When you Google and you research and you read about all these different things, here's what I know. The people hearing John the Baptist's statement did not receive that statement the way that you and I do in the Western world 2,000 years later. They were in an occupied military territory where Rome had captured all the Jews and they had to go through the, the military for permission to do all things. So people who heard this understood what he meant by being the best man, the one who gives his life in service. He's the groom. I'm the best man. It's, it's him, not me. We should reinvent our serving, which means this. How dedicated are you in serving God? Because I believe that there are probably some areas of our lives where we serve God really well, and then there are other areas that we don't. And God has to be first chair in, in how we run our business. He has to be first chair in, you know, in our relationships, how we resolve conflict, how we you know, obey and according to our mentality and according to God's rules. God has to be first chair in how we manage our money and, and responding how he wants us to respond. God has to be number one in all things. And John is just continually pushing Jesus up and lowering himself, resisting pride. And then John finally, in the very next sequential verse, makes probably the greatest statement that anybody has made about comparison and his most famous statement. Look at John chapter 3, verse number 30. John says, he, meaning Jesus, must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. John says, he must become greater and greater, I must become less and less. The distance needs to continue to be bigger. And the thing that he essentially is saying is this. He says, I am not the picture, I'm the frame. Uh, Which means, as a reminder for us, we should redirect the glory or where the glory goes. Now, this is actually the only statement that John actually did not make at all. He never said anything about a picture nor a frame. I just like the thought, okay? The idea that like, no matter how nice a frame is, it gives glory to the photo, right? It doesn't steal the attention of the photo. I think you'll agree with this. The more fancy the frame, the more prominent the photo right? The picture, you know, because all the glory, all the attention, all the awe, all the majesty, all the appreciation all needs to go to the photo, to the, to, the, to the artwork within the frame. And the frame gives glory to the photo. And that's what John's doing. He must become greater and greater. I must become less and less. And in our lives, I believe pride is so subtle. It is so powerful. It is so tricky that I believe that we constantly need to pray this prayer. And what's so interesting is that it's, it's, it's appropriate that, that his whole ministry revolves around baptism because that is what baptism actually does. I believe it does all three of these things. Number one, that we, you know, baptism you know, uh, rethinks our status, right? Because when somebody goes in, in the water and they come up out of the water, what they're really saying is the change is possible because of Jesus, not because of me. So we come up out of the water and we go, yeah, we don't go, I can do it. I can do all things. Fear Christ. It's not that. No, we come up out of the water and we celebrate because God did the change. See, actually, baptism, the purpose of baptism, the purpose of baptism is like the wedding ring of salvation. This doesn't make me married, and if I pull it off, I'm unmarried, married, unmarried. That, no, it is, a, it is an outward statement to the vows and commitments that I have made. And so by going under the water and coming up, what you're doing is you're saying God did the change. And the second thing it does, the second thing of our points is it redirects our serving. We're saying, hey, I'm going to try my very best in everything I do to walk forward, which is what Paul says. Paul says that the picture of, of him going under the water is actually a picture of Jesus being buried in the earth, dying on the cross and being buried, raising up. And that's why the Bible says when we get baptized, we walk in a whole new life just like in the likeness of his resurrection. And so what does that do? That also shines the glory on him. It's the picture of his death, burial, and resurrection. So it does all things. It reinvents our statuses, our service, and redirects the glory. That's what baptism is, because it's supposed to be a symbol. 
I want you to know that um, I was baptized as an infant when I was young in the Catholic Church, and I'm very thankful that my mom made that decision. Uh, you know, that was not my decision. It was hers and my dad's. And, uh, you know, she wanted to raise me right. She was told that that was important. And, and so later on when I, you know, uh, went to church and I understood the gospel, I understand that I can't get to heaven by myself. I have to trust in Jesus. That's what the Bible says. And I made that decision for myself, and my faith became my own. What I realized in that moment is every single time in the Bible when someone got baptized, they did so after they made a decision to trust Christ. Every time. There's not a single time where somebody got baptized in any other fashion. So, you know, you make the decision, you get saved and you're baptized. You get saved and you're baptized. And so I knew that that's what the Bible says. There's only two ordinances given to the church, uh, communion, baptism. So I went to my mom, and I wanted to get baptized as a 17-year-old uh, uh, you know, teenager. And I wanted to make sure that she understood. I said, Mom, listen, this baptism, in no way does it detract from, you know, it's not a, it's not a detraction, it's an addition, right? And this is what God says, and this is what I'm going to do. So I explained it to her, and she was very thankful. She's like, I understand, it's no big deal, I support it, I understand what you're explaining to me. And then, not only did she show up and, and witness my baptism, but then about a year later, she surprised me, and she got baptized herself. So it was super cool. And so, yeah, it was really sweet. It was really nice. And so I just got to tell you that, like, uh, if that's an issue for you, and you've always wondered about it, and you're on the fence, I want you to listen to Dave Van Epp's story on video. He's a good friend of mine, and he was baptized as an infant just like I was. I was his pastor for years and years, and then uh, and, he, and he goes through the journey explaining what it means to him. So take just a minute and watch this. Hi, I'm Dave Van Epps. I grew up in Rochester, New York, and I currently live in Harrison Township, Michigan. Growing up, life was all about me. I'd always believed that there is a God, but I was also pretty sure that God wanted nothing to do with me. I believed most of my life that the standard to get into heaven was based on following the Ten Commandments. I knew I had violated the Ten Commandments, and I believed that there was no hope. I'm going to go to hell someday, and there's really nothing I can do about it. So in 2010, I was in a pretty rough stretch of life. I had been through a divorce. Um, my girls were teenagers, and I love them dearly, but they were teenagers. And my job at the time was nuts. I was working 70 to 80 hours, and everybody was just yelling all day long. It was, it was very stressful, and I found myself in a dark place. I hadn't been to church in quite a while, and several people tried to get me to go to church. And one day, I attended a Bible-based church, and I, I heard the Word of God like I hadn't heard before. And suddenly, I wanted to go back and hear more. And the magic day was December 12, 2010. And on that day, when I went back, they were preaching from the book of Hosea. And the book of Hosea is about a story where Hosea has a wife named Gomer. And Gomer is constantly running away from Hosea. She's prostituting herself with other men. Um, but somehow, Hosea kept going back to her and and calling her and saying, come home, be with me. And I sat there and listened to the story and all I could think was, idiot, kick her to the curb, what's wrong with you? And then the story took a 180 and they explained that Hosea is really a metaphorical story about God and his love. Sorry, I've never told my salvation story without tears. Okay. okay. I thought I'd do it today, but it wasn't. Okay. Um, I had been running away from God all my life. And every time I thought that I would get close to God, I turned the other way. And I tried to replace God with God-like substitutes. Um, money, work, social activity, anything. But I suddenly realized that God didn't love me because of who I was. God actually loved me in spite of who I was. And in that moment, the weight of the world just came off my shoulders. I, I, I sat in the service and I literally sobbed for 30 minutes after the service. And one of my friends came up and said, hey, are you okay? And I looked at him and I said, yeah, for the first time in my life, I'm going to tell you I'm okay. The church I was attending at the time was a great church. I really enjoyed it. I really got to know God. I obviously had my moment where I accepted Christ. I never really considered being baptized as an adult until I came over to Heritage. 
And the more we talked about uh, the early days of Jesus and the early church, I learned more that as soon as people became believers, they were baptized. And I wanted to make that public statement to the world. And so shortly thereafter, I signed up and was baptized. It was so transformational in that everything that I had always believed was holding me down was gone. And I was new. And that was a, such a freeing, liberating, wonderful moment. I won't say life's perfect. It's not. I still have issues. I still have problems. I still have hangups. But you know what? I deal with them much better. I accept the chaos of life with a peace I never imagined possible. I take life's disappointments with a joy that only Jesus can bring. Maybe today's your day. Maybe you're considering, you know, who is this Jesus guy and should I trust him? Maybe you're wondering if you should accept him as Lord of your life. Or, and maybe you're even questioning if you should get baptized. And in all of those cases, I would say absolutely. And then fasten your seatbelt because he's going to take you on a wild ride. Yeah, that's pretty great. And I would just say once again that if you're here today and you're just like I was or Dave was and you're on the fence and like, yeah, I always wondered about that. Listen, we have a video online that actually explains all of it. You can go to uh, heritagechurch.com slash baptism to sign up for this. You go to heritagechurch.com slash Jimmy John's and, uh, and join, join the club and, and take the plunge with us. It'd just be a great day of celebration. And then also, I just want to say this, if you're here today or listening online and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior and you've never put him in the rightful position that he deserves to be in, maybe you'd want to do that for the very first time. The Bible says that we can't get to heaven by ourselves and we can't behave ourselves there and that we're all sinners and that sin demands a price and that the payment of sin is death. But the gift of God, the free gift, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what Romans 6.23 tells us. I want to let you know that with childlike faith, you can pray a simple prayer and put your faith and trust in him. And I'd like to give you an opportunity to do that. So if you would do me a favor, would you bow your head and close your eyes and pray with me? And if you want to pray that prayer for the very first time and resolve such a thing, then you can say this silently in your mind and in your heart. You can pray something like this. Father, Lord, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to the earth to die on a cross for my sins. Lord, thank you for giving me a home in heaven. And I know that I cannot get there on my own. And as best as I know how, I am putting my faith, my trust, and my belief in you. And God, I will try my very best to put you first in everything I say and do. For those people in the room who we've already trusted Christ, then, Lord, we pray this, Lord, that you would speak to us and help us to discern, Lord, what is it that you're encouraging us with or challenging us with? How is it that we need to right-size our pride to knock it down and to, and to lift you up in our lives? What area? What category? I pray, Father, that you would be clear and that we would have the courage to respond in kind. Lord, we thank you for being uh, the God who loves us and put us first when you were paying for our sins with your life on the cross. Lord, we thank you and we pray and ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.